throw our hands up to the Lord in this place? Yeah. Can we throw our hands up to the Lord in this place? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, because we are your children. And our hands are up, stretched toward our Father with an outward declaration that we need you. God, today we, we confess with our mouths that we need you. We confess with our mouths that we are not worthy of your love. We are not worthy of the grace that you have bestowed upon us. But God, today, we open our hands to receive. And you are so generous in giving us grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. God, we thank you for your love today. We thank you for your generosity to us today. We thank you for your gospel, for your good news that you came, that you died, the death that we should have died, but that you didn't stay dead, that you rose from the dead to bring us life today. And we receive life today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, say amen. Come on. Amen, amen. While you just remain standing for a moment, I just want to honor our founding pastors, Pastor Jerry and Pastor Esther are back. Can we give it up for them? They're back in the house. And as we stand for God's word, come on, y'all didn't figure that out yet? Y'all didn't figure me out yet? Oh, I've been your pastor for a couple months now. You should know me by now. We want to stand for God's word. Come on, get your word out. Get your Bibles out. If you have your phones, get your phones out. Turn to Acts chapter 2. We want to read God's word together before we say anything. We want to see what the scripture is saying. Acts chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 42, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, six verses. Can y'all handle six verses today? I'm going to preach to you today from six verses, and these verses are powerful. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, we are wrapping up part three of our Pentecost series. We started this on Pentecost Sunday. We continued it with Get Your Fill, and then we took a little break for Father's Day, and now we're picking back up to close it out here this morning. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone, say everyone, was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today, and I pray that you would speak. God, I am just a man, but your Holy Spirit is at work, and you are here today. I pray that you would speak through me, that, Lord, your words would be in my mouth, and, God, that we would receive them, Lord, with faith and with anticipation because you do desire to speak, and we are grateful for it. God, we love you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Come on, say amen. You, be, you can be seated. I want to talk to you today, and the title of my message today is Craveable Community. What do you crave? When you're up at night and the kids are at bed, in bed, what do you crave? Come on, somebody tell me. Ice cream. Ice cream. What else? What else do you crave? Chocolate. What else do you crave? What? Sleep. <laughs> Somebody said, I think that was a mom that said that. That was a mom warrior right there. I crave sleep. Uh, somebody else. What, what do you crave? Silence. silence. <laughs> Moment of silence for my brother in the back. Okay. There you go, brother. What else do you crave? Another ice cream conversation. Somebody's trying to get spiritual on me and say the Lord. Praise Jesus. Look, the thing is, 
is that this word craveable, if you look at it in the dictionary.com, the word craveable is having qualities that produce an intense desire for more. Having qualities that produce an intense desire for more. We have in life cravings. We have things that we crave, and there are reasons why we crave them, right? You can crave good things in your life. You can crave bad things in your life. Some of us have had cravings that have led us to addiction. Others of us have had cravings that have led us to a greater spiritual health in our life than we've ever had before. There are not necessarily, it's not necessarily bad to say that I crave something. The question is, what do we crave? I crave pepperoni and cheese. I crave, what do they call that? Charcuterie. I think, I think that's just a nice way of calling something <laughs> cheese and crackers. Let's call deli meat something nice so that we feel better about ourselves. Right? So it's not that what we, it's not that craving something is bad, but the question is, what do we crave? And this morning, what I want to talk to you about is craveable community, that there can exist a community, which, we, which is what? It's a gathering of people. There can exist a gathering of people that possess qualities, that possess qualities that produce an intense desire within you for more. And what I'm seeing here in the text in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, is I'm seeing a community that has attributes, qualities, things about the way that they interact with each other, things about how they exist that is so attractive that the Bible says that people were added to this community daily. New people were pouring in daily. And what I want to look at this morning is that I want us to see and take a look into how do we know that the Spirit is at work? Because for, for some of us, we would say, well, the Spirit is not something I can see, so I don't really know if the Spirit is there or if the Spirit is not there. I, and, and for some of us, we would say, if, I've, if I was to ask you right now, just real quick, go around the room and bring the mic to each one of your mouths and say, how do we know the Spirit's at work? We might not even know what to say. I don't really know what to look for. I'm not sure. I can't see the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure if I really know if the Spirit's there, if the Spirit's not there. And some of us, we might know what to say, but it might sound so different than what somebody else says. And so what do we see in Scripture about what it looks like when the Holy Spirit is at work? And while we were celebrating Pentecost Sunday, what we were celebrating is this moment, this moment of anticipation leading up to the promise of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said was coming. And these people, they were with Jesus, and he told them, it's better that I would go because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And, and so they didn't really know what it was going to look like. They didn't really know what to expect. All they knew was that it was promised, like we talked about in week one. It was promised by the Father. And if the Father makes a promise, the Father keeps his promises. Come on, say amen. It's coming back to you. You're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Because when the Father promises it, it is as good as done. For he is faithful to what he has begun. For he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete that good work. If Jesus said it, we know it's from the Father. We know it's been promised. We know it's ours. And they were waiting. And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit came into the room. And when the Holy Spirit came into the room, there was tongues of fire. And there was a rushing of a mighty wind. And there was a visible evidence because even people that were walking by were hearing their language being spoken. And there was something that they knew that the Holy Spirit was there. There was evidence. What is the evidence all these years later that the Holy Spirit is present? How do we know today that the Holy Spirit is present? And I want you to think about this because for these people, they didn't know what was going to happen when the Holy Spirit showed up. All they knew was that Jesus said he was coming. And when he showed up, they didn't expect him to show up the way that he did. 
And when he did show up the way that he did, people that were traveling around didn't expect him to show up the way that he did. But in each case, there was evidence. What is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in you? What is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in this church? And I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about a people. How do we know the Spirit is in us? How can we be sure? And I want to show you this picture. This is a, this is a, I don't like sitting out there. Okay, this is a artistic representation of the face of Jesus, okay? And what I did was we took the image, the original image. I'm going to try to hold it still. We took the original image and we printed this image out for you to see. Now, is this really what Jesus looks like or looked like when he came and put flesh on? I'm not sure. Nobody knows for sure exactly what Jesus looked like. This is just an artistic expression of the face of Jesus printed out. And what we did was we took that image and we made a copy of that image. And that looks like this. And then what we did was we took that image and we made a copy of that image and it looks like this. See any difference? Does anybody notice the difference yet? Okay, we'll keep going. So then what we did was we took that image and we made a copy and it looks like this. Are we seeing a difference yet? Okay. Show here. All right. Now, here's a copy of that image. What are you noticing that's different? What? Not as dark, lighter, okay? Not as sharp, okay? And then this is a copy of that image. Now, listen, I have a whole stack here. We could go image by image by image, but I'm going to take you to the last one. And actually, can I get, Tara, can you come here? Jamie, can you come here? All right, I want Tara, I want you to hold up the original. Jamie, I want you to stand over here, and I want you to hold up the last copy so they can see them side by side. Okay. No, you're okay. Just put me in the middle of Jesus. I feel comfortable there. (laughs) All right, so what we have here is we have the original, and we took that and made a copy. And we made a copy of 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 a copy, which I'm sure is not even enough copies to represent the amount of generations that have spanned from the time Jesus was here till now. I'm sure it wasn't as many generations. We could have probably figured it out, done the math, and done that many copies, but It's not even as many generations and we're taking a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and it ends up looking like this. What are some words you would describe, you would use to describe the difference in this one as compared to that one? It is what? Darker, what else? Distorted, what else? Faded, blurry? Okay, great. So for those of us that didn't walk with Jesus, we weren't there. The danger in being the church based on watching what the other generation has done and emulating that over the course of thousands of years is that the outcome of us as the church today is a distorted, blurry, unclear picture of Jesus. Because if we just continue to look at the last generation and go, okay, I guess that's what it looks like to be the church. And we just try to copy it. Or we look at the last generation and go, "Mm -mm, that's not what I want to be as the church. I want to be, I want it to be like this. And we make adjustments to the copy In either case, we're not looking at the right thing, are we? And so for us to know what it looks like to be the church, 
It's not that we should just look at the last generation of the church and try somehow to recreate a true image of that. It's that we should look at the church, the original church, the church that we know that existed and lived and walked with Jesus and were given his spirit. And then what did that church look like? And then we should look at ourselves. That's got to be the mirror. That's got to be the mirror that we start to reproduce, that we start to recreate. That's got to be the mirror that challenges who we are as a church. And that's got to be the mirror that causes us to say, come on, sister, keep on going. Come on, brother. We can keep on going. We can do this. Let's keep moving forward. Why? Because we have the original. It's right here. Come on, somebody say amen and give it up for these gorgeous women up here. That's my wife and my sister, so I can call them both gorgeous. And they are. I want to talk to you about craveable community this morning. And it's sad to me what the church has become. But it's not as though my goal of this morning is to just kind of like do this and make us feel like we walk out of here going like, well, I guess we just were a mess, aren't we? My goal this morning is that we would all realize that if we don't think that we are the church that's here in scripture, that we all have a responsibility. You see, where we get it wrong is when we point our finger and say, you're not the church that's blank. Because we are the church. How many are a believer of Jesus Christ and he's living in you? Raise your hand. Okay. So if your hand's up, you're the church. And we all have a responsibility to know what the church should look like. And the church should look like it does in these six verses. The first thing I want to talk to you about this morning is our community purpose. When we talk about craveable community, what is the purpose of the community? Why do we gather? Why do we gather? Why do we gather? Why do we come together? What is the purpose of the community? And the first and foremost thing, because again, we can't just talk about today. We got to drive it back to scripture. We got to drive it back to the word of God. Why did they gather? Because they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead, y'all. What? Wouldn't you gather if you saw a dead man that said he was the son of God raised from the dead? What did he do when he rose from the dead? He proved that he was who he said he was. Jesus never gave us an option to be a good teacher, to be a moral person that we could look at as a good example, his claim was, I am the son of God. His claim is either completely insane or it's the truth. But it can't be something other than those two things. And what we have here is we have people that were with him and then who he revealed himself to on the other side of his death, proving that he had, in fact, raised from the dead. Why did they gather? First and foremost, because Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, showed himself to them. And when the church is dead, it's because it's made up of people who have not had an experience of the resurrected Jesus Christ. When the church is alive and the spirit is there, it's people that have experienced the resurrected Jesus Christ in their own lives and that are saying, I have seen him with my own eyes. I've seen him. He's real. I know that he's alive. I want to ask you again, raise your hand. If you have experienced the resurrected Jesus Christ and you know that he's living, you know that he's alive because you've experienced him. Look, this is what we need as a church. Without this, we are nothing. We're just a gathering of people. And there's lots of gatherings we could be part of. But we gather because we have seen his power. 
It says, everyone was filled with awe. When's the last time you were filled with awe? When is the last time that God, you, you, you were beholding Jesus in his presence and who he was, and you were filled with awe? When it just rendered you speechless. When seeing Christ and seeing what he's done for you just dropped you to your knees because you couldn't stand anymore at the thought that he went to the cross for you, that he died for you. They were filled with awe at the many wonders and perform, that were performed by the apostles. How do we know the Spirit is at work? There is evidence of his work. God, in that time, God was using his followers, his apostles, his his people, by the power of his Spirit to bring healing to physical bodies, to minds, to souls. God was using the apostles to perform signs and wonders. And one of my, one of my favorite scriptures that is, is very close to, to my heart and my calling in life is when Paul speaks to the church in Corinth. And he says, when I was with you, I was determined to only preach Christ and Christ crucified. What was he saying? He's saying, this whole thing, it's all about Jesus, his death and his resurrection. And that's our whole message. That is what we are all about. But he says, I did not come to you with eloquent words of wisdom that you would trust in the wisdom of man. I did not come with eloquent words of speech that you would look at me and think, wow, he's so wise. I can trust him. But I came with a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we need that causes us to gather. I'm sick, but you know what? I know I can, I got, I can be prayed for and God can heal me. I'm struggling and I'm dealing with all kinds of anxiety and all kinds of pressure in my life, but I know I'm going to walk, I'm going to gather with my brothers and sisters and God's going to just use, and God's going to use that gathering and I'm going to be lifted out of that place and that anxiety is going to go and the pressure is going to go and, 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 and the suicidal thoughts will go. There is something supernatural that God wants to do in our gathering, in our coming together as the people of God. Why do we gather? Because God desires to do signs and wonders to confirm his word. And I want to ask, and I keep doing it because I'm looking for evidence. How many have had God do some kind of miracle in your life that has given you evidence that the Holy Spirit's power is still at work today? Raise your hand and look around this room. And that's okay if you can't raise your hand. The evidence is all the other hands. Because if God can do it for one, he can do it for another. Why do we gather? Because of the death of and the life and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and because of the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is at work when we gather. The Bible says where two or three gather, say the word gather. Where two or three gather, say it again. Where two or three gather together. He is in the midst. In the midst. That's not really words that we use today in our vocabulary. I wasn't, you know, I don't, Talk about that I was in the midst of my nephew's graduation party yesterday. I was in the midst. It was such a nice party I was in the midst of. But what does it mean that he's in the midst? It means he's present. He is present. Have you ever been alone trying to see God and it's like a brick wall and then you get with another brother or sister in Christ and somehow the heavens open up to you? Come on, raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. That's happened to me. That's happened to me. God's spirit is present in a greater way because the Bible says if one can put a 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. Think about the math on the exponential increase that takes place when we come together. Why do we gather? I want you to think about how many of you have ever been to a sports game before? Have you ever been to a, a stadium and seen any kind of team play in the arena? Okay. 
It's always interesting when you go to a stadium and you get there and everyone's screaming for the team and jumping up like if you've gone to a hockey game and they score the goal and the big like, and all the fans are up on their feet and they're screaming. I went to, I went to Fenway Park one time to see a Yankees game and uh, I, I was there and, and you know, every time it was horrible because I'm a Yankees fan and I was, at the, I was at Fenway Park, which is what they call it. And, and the, 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 the stadium is like one of the oldest stadiums in, in the country. And so the, the seats are like right on top of each other. And the hor- most horrible thing about this game was that I'm a Yankees fan and we were getting destroyed. And I'm in Boston. So every time there was like five or six home runs, every time in the game, home run, all the fans up on their feet, standing up, screaming at the top of their lungs, right? And we don't think anything of this. We're like, this is totally normal. And then we go to a church and people are up and they're standing and they're doing things that are loud. And we're like, what is this? What kind of church is this? I remember I was talking to someone and they were, they, were, they were reliving their first experience of coming to Calvary's Love and they had been a former Methodist and they said they came to Calvary's Love and they said that when they were here, they were like, yeah, you know, and people were clapping and jumping and there were some ladies dancing in the aisles and he goes, and you know, that was a little much. <laughs> and, uh, but he said, but something, something kept pulling us. What was, what was What was something? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not more there when we're crazier and louder and and screaming than he is when we're silent. That's not the point of what I'm saying. The point of what I'm saying is that we give an expression with our bodies, with our mouths, with our hands to things that we celebrate to things that we're passionate about, to things that we believe in. And if a whole stadium of tens of thousands of people can be exuberantly excited about their baseball team beating their rival team, then we can be a little bit more, at least a little bit more, excited about the resurrected Jesus Christ that didn't just win a game, but he won for all of eternity the keys from hell and Satan to give us life and eternity and freedom and wash away our sin as far as the east is from the west. That's something I can scream about. And you don't have to tell me I'm weird. And then go to the hockey game and think all those people are normal. I'm just excited about my Savior that he's alive and it's real to me. It's real. But I want to imagine you just showing up at that same game you went to hundreds of years later and there's no team on the field. There's no game happening. But there's someone there telling you about the game that happened thousands of years earlier. And you're supposed to experience that game the same way. Would you? And for some of us, that's church. Church is where we go and we hear about the guy that lived thousands of years ago and about what happened all that time ago. And it's someone telling us about it and trying to convince us that that's something that we should feel somehow, that that's something we should connect to. But let me tell you, our God is personal. And he doesn't want you to just hear about something that took place. For the believers in the very beginning, he wants you to experience it today. What should our gathering look like? What is the community content? The Bible says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the word of God, and to fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so, listen. This is not a formula that if you do these things, the Holy Spirit is going to be whoosh. And the reason I'm smiling is because I've been at places that do these things and feel no spirit. I've been in gatherings where there's fellowship, there's breaking of bread, right? 
there's some food that they're eating, there's some fellowship, maybe they, they have, maybe there's even some, some Bible reading and prayer, and it is void of the Spirit. It is not as though God is saying in this text, here's how if you do these things, you will experience the Spirit of God. That is not what we're saying here. But there was something unique about the gathering that caused it to look different, to feel different, to be different. And there's something about the gathering that is needed in order to accomplish it. I want to point out to you from this text something that you might have missed because it's words that we often don't give much of our thought to because we look, when we're reading, our minds are scanning and looking for the important words. There's even ways out there that you can learn how to speed read, which is basically a, a technique on looking for the important words to be able to get through something quicker, right? But if we do that, sometimes we miss the parts that matter. In these six verses, I want to read to you some words that matter. They, everyone, all the believers, together, they, they, together, they, there, together, all the people, there. Twelve times. Twelve is the number of completion. In this six verses, the Bible is saying there is completion only if and when you do this in the context of community. Do what? What is the overarching, defining attribute of what we read in these scriptures? It's found in John 13. And Jesus said it. He said, they will know you by your love. And you know, when Jesus said that in John 13, he said, I'm bringing you a new commandment. And this wasn't a new commandment to love because it was always in the old covenant. It's always been there. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Like, there, there's always been this teaching. But what was different was that Jesus was saying, just as I have loved you, love one another. Just as I have loved you, love one another. And they will know that you are my followers by your love for each other. Did you know how much the Bible is filled with these statements? One another, one another, one another, one another. Be at peace with each other. Wash one another's feet. Love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. These are all different verses. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another. Live in harmony with one another. Love one another. Stop passing judgment on one another. Accept one another. Instruct one another. Greet one another. When you come together to eat, wait for each other. Have equal concern for each other. Greet one another. Greet one another. Serve one another in love. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, you will be destroyed by each other. Let, not, let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Carry each other's burdens. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Do not lie to each other. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Teach one another. Admonish one another. Make your love increase and overflow for each other. Love each other. Encourage each other. Encourage each other. Build each other up. Encourage one another daily. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Encourage one another. Do not slander one another. Don't grumble against each other. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. Live in harmony with one another. Love each other deeply. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Greet one another with a kiss of love. 
Love one another. 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 59 times the Bible says these words. One another. There is something biblical showing you you cannot exist in your life with Jesus Christ without the body. Jesus says that the church is the body of Christ. Because this is what Jesus had in mind. And not so much in this building and not so much in this room, but gathering. It's what Jesus had in mind. And that's why you can't get around the fact that 12 times in this text, it's they and there and together and each other. And it's seeing that through this miraculous supernatural text of what you're seeing take place in the church, this gathering where there was, there was a commitment to the word of God, a commitment to scripture, a commitment to, it says the apostles teachings, which the apostles were used by God to give a revelation to the people of who Jesus was through scripture. And God is still called and appointed apostles today. It's, the, it's one of the five-fold ministries that still exists, that Paul teaches still exists today. And the apostle is simply the man that God will bring revelation of Christ's life through Scripture. And we still need those men today. We still need people that can show us through the revelation of the Holy Spirit who Christ is through Scripture. But... He has given this to you to pick up and read every day and commit yourself to it every day. And they committed themselves to the word every day and to fellowship, to being together. It says they met in the temple courts and together in homes and they broke bread with each other. And they said, which is also, it was to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It was to, to remember Jesus because let's remember it all goes back to that. But it was also to eat together. And even in the new heavens, what we see is we see the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb where we will all be gathered together in heaven having a meal together. There is something significant about sitting down and having meals together that joins our hearts because it's how God made us to live. And it says they committed themselves to prayer. And this is the content of their gathering. But what made it different than anybody else was their love. It was the way that they ate together. It was the way that they fellowshiped together. It was the way they talked about the word together. And even the two men walking on the road to Emmaus, they, they looked at each other at when, G, when they realized that it was actually Jesus that was breaking down the scripture to them. All of a sudden, they realize it and their eyes are open to see him. And when he leaves, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking? It is the way that we look at Scripture, the way we speak about Scripture, the way that we pray, and not so much a tone, a volume, those things, about the power that we have through prayer. I, I, I was with my Oma just recently, and she's 95 years old, and she's frail, and she forgets things, and she's very soft-spoken, and she sleeps and lays down a lot because she's, the end is near for her. She's 95. But when she prays, whoosh, the river of God flows through her so powerfully. My wife and I just sat there kneeling at, 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 by, by her feet in her home, weeping because of the power of Jesus that's flowing through her in prayer. Now, if that's not an example of what we can experience through prayer, a frail 95-year-old woman where the Spirit of God is still at work through her prayers. This is not a formula to say if we if we have fellowship and we eat food together and we have communion and we pray and we talk about the word, the spirit's going to be there. No, no, it is the way we do those things. Is there love? Is there connectivity? Is there unity? Is there a joining? Is there a mutual respect for one another? Is there an adoration and awe and, 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 and just complete, just, enamored feeling within us to say, Jesus has captured my affections. And oh my gosh, he's captured your affections too, Casey. Wow, yeah, isn't it crazy what Jesus is doing in our lives? And then me and Casey just start talking and we just start realizing like the evidence of how God's working in our lives together and it makes the connection different. It makes the way we connect with each other different, the way we eat and have meals and the way we talk different. Why? Because Jesus 
D.A. Carson says, he says, that the church is a natural band of enemies joined together because of Jesus. What does that mean? That means that the church doesn't just look like a bunch of people that have a lot of this one thing in common. And that's that we all love the Yankees. You know? Because there's a lot of Yankee haters out there. I could tell just by the way you laughed. Right? It's that we have a lot of things that we don't have in common, but what we do share is our love for Jesus. They will know us by our love. Oh, man, I wish I had more time. The last thing I want to say in this point here, here is this. Because look, if you don't put scripture in context, it doesn't hold the true power. When Jesus said, when Jesus said, they will know you are my followers by the way that you love one another. Do you know what happened just before that? He got betrayed by Judas. And you know what happened just before that? He got down on his knees and he washed his disciples' feet. You know, you know why that matters? It's because it, it always costs you something. Always costs you something. Community benefit. How do we benefit the gathering? Now, the first thing I want to point out about that question is that most, and I'm going to speak for our culture, I can't speak for other cultures, most Americans ask that question differently. Most Americans ask the question, how does the community benefit me? But the question is not, how do I personally benefit from the gathering? The question is, how do we benefit the gathering. My autocorrect on my computer didn't even agree with me. It didn't like the way I was writing that. Because we typically say, how can we benefit? But what we're saying is, how can we, how can we benefit the gathering? Not, not how can we benefit from the gathering? How can I? Somebody just got it. That's why sometimes, you know, if, if I ever go a little too long on one part, it's because of moments like that. Sometimes it takes a little extra, let's break it down, a little bit, oh, okay, yeah. And I need it because, look, I will oftentimes walk into a gathering and think, well, what is this bringing me? Well, what can I get from it? And if we think this way about church, it is a result of the consumeristic culture that we live in. This is why it is so predominant for Americans to think this way. Because we live in a consumeristic culture. Okay, I know it's going to cost me something, but I will pay for the membership if I like what I'm getting in return. If I don't like what I'm getting in return, I'm going to end the membership and find somewhere where I do like it. Now, that's not wrong when you're talking about the gym, you know, or when you're talking about a product that you purchased that was garbage, and you thought, I didn't get my money's worth here. That's not wrong when it comes to products, but the church is not a product. The church is a people, and the people that we are part of, and our leader decided that he did not come to be served. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. And what does he do? He gets down on his knees and he washes the dirty mud and other things that were on the streets in that time from open sandals that they wore. He washes it off of their feet. He assumes the lowliest position in washing his disciples' feet. He gets up from doing that. And then Judas is acknowledged as his betrayer, which was one of his 12 closest followers that he had poured himself into for, few, for three years. And Judas was released to go and carry out the betrayal. And right after that, Jesus speaks about this commandment. 
What was he showing us? It's going to cost us something. It's going to cost you something. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I want to read to you what it looked like in Acts chapter 4, just a couple, couple chapters later. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Isn't that powerful? For, the, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Timothy Keller says, all real life changing love is substitutionary sacrifice. If it's going to be a love that changes you profoundly, it's going to cost the other person something. One theologian put it this way. If Luke were writing today, he would be saying that a prerequisite for being a member of the Christian community was to renounce private property. What? This blows our paradigm. This, this blows our paradigm so much. But can we just start with this? We get to do this. God, forgive me when my mindset in giving is begrudgingly. God, forgive me when I'm opening my home for people to come in and to, to care for them that I'm, I'm frustrated that I have to clean. God, forgive me that when I'm meeting with somebody that I know is going through something difficult and I don't feel like it and I'm not in the mood, God, forgive me because, God, my heart is in a position that is saying to you that I am not doing this from the right spirit. But the Bible says that they did it with glad and sincere hearts. The Bible says in Luke 14, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you can, you have, cannot be my disciples. Can you imagine giving up everything? Which of us here are his disciples? If being his disciple means giving up everything, which of us are? God, forgive me that I re willingly receive what it costs you at the cross. I receive it gladly, and I lift my hands to worship you because you gave your life. But yet, I'm unwilling to give mine. I'm unwilling to pay the price. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. The last thing I want to point out to you is the commitment of the community. And I want to show you here something important. The question is, how often do we gather? And the answer is in verse 46, and it says, every day. What? What does that mean? Every day they continue to meet together. I want to read an excerpt to you from Letters to the Church by Francis Chan. And I want to warn you before I read it, it's a little bit confrontational to what we know. But when you hear it, I want you to remember That this is not what we're going for. This is not our goal. To have a distorted, blurry, unclear picture of Christ that we represent to the world. And Chan says, we live in a time when people go to a building on Sunday mornings, attend an hour-long service, and call themselves members of the church. Does that sound shocking to you? Of course not. This is perfectly normal. It's what we grew up with. 
We all know good Christians go to church. But have you ever read the New Testament? Do you find anything in Scripture that is even remotely close to the pattern we have created? Do you find anyone who, quote, went to church? Try to imagine Paul and Peter speaking like we do today. Hey, Peter, where do you go to church now? Oh, I go to the river. They have great music, and I love the kids' program. Cool. Can I check out your church next Sunday? I'm not getting much out of mine. Totally. I'm not going to be there next Sunday because little Matthew has soccer, but how about the week after? Sounds good. Hey, do they have a singles group? (laughs) It's comical to think of Paul and Peter speaking like this. Yet that's a normal conversation among Christians today. Why? There are so many things wrong with the above conversation, I don't even know where to start. The fact that we have reduced the sacred mystery of church to a one-hour service we attend is staggering. Yet that's the way I defined it for years. I didn't know anything different. It's what everyone did. So I didn't think to question it. Chan goes on to say, My mind flashed back to five years prior when my daughter and I went to an underground gathering in China. Young people were praying so passionately. begging God to send them to the most dangerous places. They were actually hoping to die as martyrs. I had never seen anything like it. I I still can't get over the fearless passion for Jesus this church embodied. As they shared stories of persecution, I sat in amazement and asked for more stories. After a while, they asked why I was so intrigued. I told them the church in America was nothing like this. I can't tell you how embarrassing it was to try to explain to them that people attend 90-minute services once a week in buildings, and that's what we call, quote, church. I told them about how people switch churches if they find better teaching, more, more exciting music, or more robust programs for their kids. As I described church life in America, they began to laugh. Not just small chuckles, they were laughing hysterically. I felt like a stand-up comedian, but I was simply describing the American church as I've experienced it. They found it laughable that we could that we could read the same scriptures they were reading and then create something so incongruent. And that's hard to read. That's hard because I can remember a few years ago preaching from this text. I was preaching from the same scripture. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. And I got done preaching the sermon. And as soon as I finished preaching, depression fell over me. I mean, the cloud and the weight of depression. And the overwhelming feeling inside of me as I read these six verses we looked at this morning and as I got done preaching them was, this will never happen. There would literally have to be a grenade that goes off in the church that, as we know it, not, not physically, literal grenade. I'm saying there would have to be something so so catastrophic to just blow up what we know within the paradigm of what we know it here and how we live it out for that to ever happen. And one month later, a global pandemic came and completely closed down the church. The question is, as we return to be the church that God has called us to be, Will we return to what we know here and what we've experienced or will we return to this? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. The first invitation that I have to give to you today is is really an invitation that will change the life that you have. The Bible calls it a new birth. Jesus says that when you make this decision that 
it's as if you were born again and you become a new person it's a new life and that person that you become is a member of the family and the body of Christ and the body of Christ that you are joining yourself to is a body of love and unity it's a body that is committed to living for Jesus who showed us what love even is and if you're here today and you desire to be part of that community you desire to be born again to be made new I want to ask you just to lift up your hand right now so that I can see it and I'm going to pray with you I see hands going up all around this room is there anybody else come on let me see it yep. anybody else thank you thank you thank you brother thank you thank you thank you so many hands going up here today so many hands going up here today okay you can put your hand down if you've lifted your hand up more hands than I could count I want you to pray with me and if you already belong to Jesus your life is his I want you to help them pray come on let's say these words together say Jesus thank you that you love me that you died for me that you rose from the dead and that you came to bring me life I pray that you forgive me of my sins that you make me a new person so that I can be born again I could be part of your family thank you that you love me and I love you Jesus and I give you my life today in Jesus name amen amen can we celebrate with all those that have made the decision today <laughs> Yes. This is your day. For you, uh, that you made that decision today. Come on, one more time. Let's celebrate the fruit of what God has done today. I'm going to ask you to respond to one final invitation, and that is that you want to commit yourself personally. How do we, I think a, there's, there's, a, there's a good question sometimes when we get done hearing something, and it is, what are we to do next? And I want to give, I want to give two responses to this word today, really three, because we already gave the first, which is a salvation response. Many people responded, praise, praise God. And the Bible says that no man comes to the Father except for the Spirit that draws him. And so that's not something that man did or that you just did. That is a work of the Spirit. It's supernatural. The second response is I want to make something personal. And then the third response is going to be something corporate. And so as a personal response to this word today, I want to ask you, this is a very practical thing that I want to ask you to commit to. But for this whole next week, for this whole next week, I want to ask you to read these six verses every day. And I want to ask you to pray these six verses over your life every day. And so that's just simply opening up your Bible, turning to Acts chapter 42 to 47, and reading through those six verses, and then just praying.